Good afternoon ladies and gentlemen welcome to the annual memorial lectures 2024 in honor of Dr Nadraja Sivaraja who was most admired for his versatility and perseverance in keeping the department of community and family medicine and population based health services functioning despite numerous challenges of those difficult times we are gathered here today to pay tribute to the enduring legacy and contributions of Dr Nadraja Sivaraja whose impact continues to inspire us all today we have our distinguished orator professor Sarod J Singh emeritus professor of medicine and founder professor of medical humanities university of colombo to give the memorial lectures on humanities in medical education current and future before we proceed further may i kindly request a moment of silent prayer to honor the memory of dr naraja sivaraja thank you lighting the oil lamp symbolizes the dispelling of darkness and the ushering of light knowledge and prosperity i would like to invite professor s sri satguna raja vice chancellor university of jaffna to light the oil lamp Thank you sir following that i would like to call upon professor r surendra kumaran dean faculty of medicine university of jaffna to light the oil lamp thank you sir i would like to call professor saraj jay singh emeritus professor of medicine and founder professor of medical humanities university of colombo to light the oil lamp Thank you sir following that i would like to call upon dr dinesh kunje head department of community and family medicine faculty of medicine university of jaffna to light the oil lamp thank you sir and i would like to call upon mrs maliyarsi sivaraja the better half of dr naraja sivaraja to light the oil lamp thank you I kindly request Professor S. Sri Satguna Raja, Vice Chancellor, and Professor R. Surendra Kumar, and Dean, Faculty of Medicine, and the Orator Professor Saroj J. Singh, Emeritus Professor of Medicine, University of Colombo, to come forward and take their seats in the head table. Thank you. Next, I would like to invite Professor S. Sri Satguna Raja, Vice Chancellor, University of Jaffna, to deliver the address. Anandamai. നറിവായ് നിറയുന്ന അമൃതവുമായി വാണന്ന മാന വടിയുടിയാൾ മറൈ നാൻകിനുക്കും താണന്ന മാന സർനാരമിന്നും കവളങ്ങൾ ആണെന്നും ആടിരങ്കാം അമ്പുരാൻ മുടി കണ്ണിയത് സോ ഇൻ ദി സെയിം സെയിൻസ് സെയ്സ് ഡിവൈൻ മദർ ഹു ബ്രിങ് ജോയ് ഇൻ ദ പീപ്പിൾ ലൈഫ് ഇൻ ദ മീൻസ് ഓഫ് നോളേജ് So University of Jaffna is a knowledge center where various discipline of knowledge are cultivated. My guru is a teacher for us Dr. Ensuraya who brought happiness in many of the student life not only in the medical faculty in the entire community by the virtue of knowledge. and also his practice as a doctor so we miss him at the same time we fondly remember him because he pioneered with the nandi sir as a twin barrel the twin towers they put up a very good department and the system and also the malayarsi madam who was assistant there so she has inaugurated this uh, memorial lecture this lecture bring opportunity for all of us to listen one of the towering personality of this entire country in the field of medicine so it's a purpose of memorial lecture it's a knowledge dissemination the experts they develop their skill in solitude they work hard for years and years and then they enrich and they reach the everest 
of their discipline from there after retirement also they keep on helping the entire countries entire countries even in the who level world health organization level in the entire world in helping the people to come out with a better system because the system evolved because the dynamics is always the important thing in the life got six and change so in this regard so i don't need to go more on on the proceeds uh, uh, doctor swaraja her daughters are here and two daughters one of them is the chair of chairing the chemistry department as a chair professor in chemistry other one is chairing the library so entire family is actually devoted to the upliftment of the university of japna in the all realm of life one is library other one is chemistry so here today we have a distinguished personality so i have the privilege of uh, introducing him and you are the one the fortunate one you are going to sit down and relax and listen to him because uh, the tarshan of people of this caliber is very rare maybe uh, narada muni says the association of rare people is maybe due to our pious activities of the previous birth because uh, for a person like me in the discipline of mathematics to meet uh, professor or introduce the professor saroj yesing is uh, actually a time brought this opportunity otherwise i wouldn't have this um, uh, uh, fortunate uh, contact today a uh, fortunate contact today so it's my privilege to introduce formal introduction of uh, our speaker today professor saroj jay singh graduated from the faculty of medicine university of colombo with honors in 1979 when this uh, faculty was inaugurated actually in 78 so 79 he graduated he joined the faculty in 1982 and retired in 2021 as a fifth chair of professor of medicine with 37 years of service as an honorary consultant physician he was likely the nh sri lanka's longest serving consultant he passed the mrcp uk and received fellowship uh, fellowships from the royal college of physician london the ceylon college of physicians the national academy of sciences of sri lanka and the international science council so very distinguished uh, area of achievements in this uh, research and the qualifications the research professor jay singer was the first batch of md medicine graduate from the pa pgim and the first local md graduate in medicine to complete research doctorate by thesis actually i i know phd's i know sometimes double phd he got triple phd's i'll tell you So he was awarded a research MD from the University of Bristol for his thesis on observation on the disposition of paracetamol in man. In 2016 he was awarded the third doctorate through the Faculty of Graduate Studies in Colombo for his thesis on poverty, ill health and social welfare policies a study of the urban poor in Sri Lanka. He has over 150 peer reviewed publication spanning clinical reasoning to population health and his current research interests include mediation in diabetes complexity science in urban health decolonization and medical education and system system thinking in clinical medicine he was ranked among the world top 2% scientists in the science wide or the database of the standardized citation indicators by the stanford university of us us actually is a remarkable uh, unbelievable achievement the top 2% scientists of the world academic advancement he introduced novel concepts of the academic discourse in sri lanka on topics such as economic evaluation of health in the 1960s and the early 2020s topics on uh, topics on social determinants of health mathematical modeling and system science 
In the latter field, he has published extensively on the role of complexity science in clinical medicine and clinical reasoning and population health. More recently, his ideas aided the faculty in launching the mediation research program and developing a rural health center at Kadarakama. Curriculum reforms, he played a key role in the pioneering curriculum reforms in the Faculty of Medicine, Columbia in 1990s, and served as the first director of MEDARC, the precursor of the Department of Medical Education, and has contributed to several development in medical education, introduction of behavioral sciences, problem-based learning, and skills laboratories uh, skills laboratories to the medical curriculum and medical humanities he led the initiated that led to the establishment of the department of medical humanities in 2060s the first of its kind in sri lanka and the, in the region in july 2018 he organized the first international conference on medical humanities and in colombo the medical congress in 2020 he was the inaugural professor of Carlo Fonsogas orator in 2021 and has delivered several guest lectures, keynote addresses, and workshops on medical humanities locally and overseas. He has served as a member of the advisory board of IMU's, IMU's <coughs> Center for Bioethics and Humanities and as an advisor to develop the curriculum in medical humanities in the first medical school opened in the Bhutan. He's, he continues to lead the initiative in the Hu South Asia, Southeast Asia region. He could position Sri Lanka as the hub for the global initiative to introduce humanities to health professional education. Currently, he is a leading regional initiative to, he is leading a regional initiative to introduce humanities to health professional education and coordinate global network on health humanities. So humanities is a part which is the oldest in the entire knowledge um, assimilation, but we, are, we, had, we had to rethink about this because that's a part now every professionals want to think about. So today our title oration is humanities in medical education, current and future. I welcome our Professor Saroj Yasinga to the podium, please. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Once again, I would like to call upon Professor S. Sri Satmunaraja, Vice Chancellor, University of Jaffna, to honor our orator, Professor Saroj Yasinga, Emeritus Professor of Medicine, University of Colombo, with a medal. Thank you, sir. Without any further delay, I would like to invite Professor Sarah J. Singer, Emeritus Professor of Medicine and Founder Professor of Medical Humanities, University of Colombo, to deliver the memorial lecture. Over to you, sir. Vice Chancellor, the Dean, Faculty of Medicine, members of Dr. Nadaraj Sibaraja's family, Mm -hmm. friends, colleagues, and students. I thank the Faculty of Medicine and the University of Jaffna for inviting me to deliver the Dr. Nadaraja Sivaraja Memorial Lecture. My association with him are indirect. I too went to Ananda College and he had been to Ananda College, Colombo, for two years and studied in the same faculty, that's Faculty of Medicine, Colombo. He was an internal refugee uh, and left Anuradhapura in 1977 due to post-election violence and was a leader, a teacher, an advocate for health, a researcher, an academic, a community physician and a humane person. Mm -hmm. 
having read about uh, Dr. Sivaraja's life and spoken to those who knew him, what strikes me most is his gentle dedication and unwavering commitment to help the poor, the marginalized, the oppressed, and the voiceless. He did so without expecting any favors or accolades in return, and his work shows a striking pattern seen in an altruistic, compassionate, and humane person, despite undergoing personal suffering and seeing violence all around him. His list of commit, uh, uh, the list of things he has done is innumerable. I've just selected a few. He founded the NGO dedicated to public education related to leprosy. That's after a certain personal experience. That's the Association for Health and Education Development, which still functions. He was a key figure in the Association for Rehabilitation of the Disabled to help those who were affected by injuries and other forms of defects. He tenaciously studied childhood malnutrition during the conflict and exposed the truth of a crisis in nutrition that was affecting future generations. He then became the president of Kane Jaffna Hospice, helping those in terminal stages of their lives, often from cancer. Dr. Sivaraja also helped to develop a night ambulance service in Jaffna in 2006 at a time when the area was in intense conflict and injuries were frequent. He ensured polio vaccination during the conflict and succeeded where others failed. As a result, immunization went ahead for most vulnerable groups affected by the conflicts. In another instance, he prevented a boycott of the advanced level examination which was initiated by an armed group. In his own words, he says, as Tamils, we have placed a lot of faith in education. If we interrupt education, everything will collapse. And that was one turning point, I think. If we had allowed that, today there wouldn't be a university, there wouldn't be anything. Those are his words. So I get on to the topic of today's lecture because going through his life, I was so impressed by Dr. Sivanaja's unique pattern of empathy, compassion, and altruism. And I hope to explore these themes during my presentation. As to give a few definitions. Sympathy is a feeling of sorrow and concern for another's pain or suffering. That's what we do when we see, for example, a person who is begging. We don't spend much time. We give some money and we move on. You have empathy where you're experiencing another person's pain. So a person is in pain, distress, and you feel. So when a person who is close to you is, is, a, is crying because of a loved one of that person losing their lives, when that person is crying, you feel, you put yourself in that person's shoes and think, oh, if I am in that position, what would it be? and you also start to cry. That's empathy. Compassion is defined slightly differently as a feeling which arises when you witness the suffering, but you're motivated to help. That's what happens when a mother sees the child in distress. You don't cry because the child is crying, but you immediately 
react, help, and alleviate the suffering of the child. Altruism, on the other hand, is the attitude for caring about others and helping them without anything, expecting anything in return. And that, I think, is a feature of the medical profession. Those who are who have worked with patients, you would have had your moments of altruism where you know you are helping people, you will never meet them again. And the pleasure you get by helping them cannot be measured by money. Dr. Sivaraj, I think, came into that category. He was altruistic, compassionate, and empathic. So the question is, despite all these disadvantages he faced, his compassion survived. His altruism survived. It grew. Shouldn't we be doing the same with our medical students? Amidst economic crisis or whatever crisis, shouldn't we try to improve and work on their compassion, their empathy and their altruism. So these are the questions. Is it necessary? Yes. We are trying to follow what Dr. Sivaraja did and there is enough evidence to say that it is necessary that we make our health professionals more compassionate and more empathic. Can empathy and compassion be developed or nurtured? I will give you a few examples. There are several ways of doing it, but I'm going to focus on one area and that's a role for the arts in fostering empathy and compassion among healthcare workers. And what are the experiences of other countries and what we have learned from Colombo. So is it really necessary? I mean, why do we want to follow Dr. Sivanagar's example? There are good reasons as I mentioned before, the, the returns you get cannot be measured. And some of us are still working because of that pleasure we get by meeting people and helping them. But there are other advantages also. It's well known that patients value kindness. And when the doctor is kind, they get cured faster, again shown innumerable times with good clinical trials. It improves health outcomes. It enhances drug compliance. They adhere to the advice doctors give. And also there is this worrying situation we are seeing. Several studies have shown that medical students lose their empathy when they start clinical work. So initially they come very good human beings and as medical teachers and faculties we are very successful in making them less humane. So all these things uh, mean that we have to really look at uh, instilling compassion and empathy in healthcare. The final point has been shown in numerous studies and even in systematic reviews. So can empathy and compassion be developed or nurtured? That's the next question. Can we replicate Dr. Sivaraj? Can we clone him? How do we do that? Yes, we can because there are several studies which have looked at it and there are books and there are courses. I mean, in Stanford, they are running an eight-week compassionate cultivating course. Now, the sad thing is Sri Lanka, India and the South Asian region, which where we are where our culture and religion is based on compassion. We don't seem to be doing this. We are 
in a victorian era and that's where decolonization is important because we have lost our bearings in a sense and we are really not tapping into the rich heritage the rich culture which we were born to even if we want to get early alienated from that culture we have no choice because our patients are in that culture so we have to respect their culture and their beliefs and their religion and so on so can uh, empathy and compassion be developed or nurtured yes it can be in colombo we came up with this structure of how humanness can be improved so there are different uh, techniques we could use uh, emotional intelligence that's learning about your in- emotions as well as learning about the patient's emotions if you are able to read the mind of a of your patient you will be responding to their emotions and those who are sitting post graduate exams now when it comes to pacers and all these overseas exams you would have noticed how they want you to deal not only with the medical problem they want you to deal with their emotions their ideas their concerns that's important in your doctor patient relationship religion also plays a role and most if not all the religions are favoring kindness compassion and so on mindfulness and meditation helps because that helps to look at your own emotions and you realize when you are getting angry you realize when things are when you are feeling uncomfortable with that patient so that you can avoid confrontations with your patients narratives is another way where you listen to patient stories uh, we ask the students to go and write a short story or a novel about your patient not about the differential diagnosis not about the illness what was your patient doing as a child which school did they go to how did they you know grow up and ultimately end up as a patient in front of you so it's more of uh, an investigation into their story their life story so these help to sensitize and of course we have increasingly used the arts and humanities because we feel that the arts and humanities are directed towards your emotions and we can actually bring in the arts to cause that change in the person's attitudes what we call transformative learning so if we look at the role of arts in medical education again uh, there is a vast knowledge base it's in sri lanka we have not really tapped into this but there is a vast knowledge base the first medical uh, department of medical humanities in the us was opened in 67 again it was a reaction to the technological type of medicine the first journal came up in 1979 then the europeans got into the act and now the uh, american uh, medical associ- medical colleges have emphasized the role of arts and humanities in education and uh, there are now even degree programs on medical humanities which is to look at the interface between how art the arts and health even in the sierra region we have had several initiatives um colombo introduced the behavioral sciences stream which brought in medical ethics communication skills 
and personal development in a more structured way. There were programs in Nepal in, and in India, several programs in India, which have looked at uh, the, the use of arts and humanities in medical education. So we went on to do a scoping review. And over the next few minutes, I will give you a few concrete examples which you may want to consider uh, and use even in Jaffna. So it was a standard systematic way we did. We used the PubMed database and these were the search items. We had certain inclusion and exclusion criteria and uh, for those who may not be familiar, we followed the standard uh, process which is given in the guidelines on performing a scoping review. And we came up with 41 studies which looked at humanities, arts in relation to medical education. Now over the next few slides, I'm going to synthesize this with some of the experiences we have from Colombo also. So, in order to synthesize this, we've got this model. Again, we use this model in curriculum. Yeah. He's proposed this model somewhere in 2007 in Colombo. You have certain outcomes, and based on the outcomes you want, you have contents. Then there are teaching learning methods. How are you going to sequence this? These are problems for for a person who is developing the curriculum, the syllabus. Who is, whoever is writing the syllabus must know what you want the outcome to be. So in, uh, in the case of humanities, it is you want the outcome to be that the person is more compassionate, more empathic or an altruistic doctor. So how are you going to do this? You will have to have a certain amount of content being taught or learnt. How are you going to sequence this? And what sort of methods do we use? How are you going to assess and evaluate this? This is fairly standard, but I showed this to you because the next few slides are going to be based on this. So we have different models for introducing medical humanities. Some have not included it in the curriculum officially. It's part of the hidden curriculum. So they have, uh, this is something which we also had and most faculties have this. The students are having concerts, the students are having uh, musical programs, photography exhibitions, completely outside the curriculum. It's what we call the hidden curriculum. Then in some universities you have electives. Now in Colombo we have four weeks where the students are able to do whatever topic they want. And uh, if you may recall, uh, in the, I was traveling with, uh, with uh, the, your dean and I was in a Zoom with some of the students who wanted to do an elective on planetary health. So they can do on whatever topic. And we encourage some of them to do on humanities. And right now we've got two Bhutanese students who are doing one on art appreciation and uh, in relation to health and illness. So electives is one, or you can have it mandatory. It's part of the curriculum. Everybody has to attend. It can be modules, few weeks, or themes which can go on for quite a long time. Or it can be integrated. We we'll give you some examples later on. So there are different models of medical humanities in the region. And these are managed by different organizational structures. See, you can't just start something in a university. You have to have it has to be either a department or a unit or a center or an informal group or whatever. And this is where we have advanced because we have got in Colombo a department of medical humanities with dedicated staff and 
there is most of the teaching is done by medical people which is not something which you get in most other universities overseas medical humanities often they are run by the people from humanities but we have got a different model so you can have <clears throat> some sort of group which is recognized by the senate or the university system to to do this so what are the expected outcomes there's a long list i'll give you just 30 seconds to read that and you'll see promoting empathy positive professional attitudes and behavior are right on top preventing dehumanizing technical approach to medicine right and respect for diversity and so on. so there's a wide range of outcomes which universities want to achieve by their medical humanities courses and they are during they are using different models of curricula some are having it as electives some are having it as mandatory modules or streams and they are being done in some instances by departments or by loosely admitted groups of interested people okay and the interesting one is this the the range of art forms which are used there's a wide range i color coded it the blue ones relate to literature right so poetry reading narratives storytelling and so on the red ones are related to visual arts drawings portraits comics graphics posters photography cinema the green ones are more activity oriented silent mentors wheelchair bound you know your get students to sit on a wheelchair and take them around then you feel what a person in a wheelchair feels like so we performance dance theater music and so on so it's very interesting to look at these experiences from different countries um now in colombo itself we do this where we give students to analyze short stories um i mentioned about narratives then we'll look at a, an example of a poem which we use and storytelling this is a book which was written by a well known uh, dramatist hendri jasena who died from carcinoma of the colon so when he got the cancer of the colon he describes how he went to meet the doctor and when the doctor told the story that you have got a cancer within a few minutes his whole life changed he described this it as a a thunderbolt which struck him one moment you are going in as a healthy person and you are coming out of that room thinking that your life is limited few years painful and you don't know what's going to happen a thunderbolt so we get them to read these and this again uh, you might know dr miranda she in fact trained with us she was one of our graduates uh, she has written this book on organ donation again the issues related to organ donation and organ transplant right so it's a must for transplant people who are doing transplants in relation to poems this is written by the husband of a 
the wife was dying from cancer and was getting chemotherapy so we get students to read this and come and discuss now sometimes as with anything even in this lecture you will find certain students not really keen you know it, it, it just goes out of the that that's okay because there be others who are engaged there be a few who will really be affected by it right this for example this story if you relate it you really realize that the patient who is there in the in the ward getting chemotherapy may be undergoing this sort of emotion for us it's chemotherapy and you're giving antiemetics to reduce the side effects but for the patient and that person who is looking after that patient it's a battle of about living about surviving their love and realizing that everything is going to end and that's a very difficult situation so these we feel uh, these exposures there is evidence that these exposures help students to become pro social or more empathic because there are scales to measure empathy like the jefferson scale and uh, they change the attitudes of doctors and students when it comes to visual area a very useful uh, method is to use trigger films trigger films is you take a particular part of a film you can get them to see the whole film now right now there's a cine club in the faculty and uh, they are having a competition on trivia but uh, they show once a month they show a film and sometimes there is a discussion for example once they showed um, can't remember the name but that was where a, a journalist was privy to some information on the british going to war in iraq right the journalist came to know about it because in the in the secret service there was this person who was going through and suddenly got this memo which showed that the british government was going to lie to the british people tony blair was going to lie to the british people so that they could go to war against iraq that's a true story and she leaked it to the, her journalist friend now it's very tense film but uh, is there a message for doctors yes because sometimes we do see patients also confidentiality issues patient comes to you and divulges certain information and you have a dilemma are you going to break that confidentiality in case it's going to harm a lot of people or are you going to wait without telling it to anyone so when you we get the students to see the film and you ask these questions you don't have to give answers because sometimes there are no answers but at least they must know to reflect and know to make their choice and when you make the choice you know why you are making the choice so person a will say i will divulge whatever is the patient says if there's a danger to society and dr b will say no i will not divulge and i will face the music and go to jail but you know why you are doing it okay so uh, films can be very powerful fine art 
again we have this visual learning st- thinking strategies which we use i will take you through one of those right then you can have photography and now with the mobile phones and the students liking the mobile phones so much you know there are ways of tapping into that because they can produce short films short films have become a rave and there are courses been run even in the university of colombo for 25000 rupees on making short films using your mobile so students can now take photographic evidence so one example in india was i can if you can hear me i can continue is it likely to come back or shall i continue it might come back but anyway while we are on this slide i might as well tell you can you all hear me at the back can right sorry can yeah so uh, in this particip- participant photography what you do is where you get students to record so it could be solid waste for example uh, in india they had used this on toxic environmental hazards so students go and then they take photographs and they come back to the faculty and show it to each other and then you have some discussion uh, body painting to learn anatomy and comics to teach again those are fairly well known uh, examples and this is a film of this director and the main actor uh, he had ocd obsessive compulsive disorder and he made the film and it's about his life so again it's a very useful way to start a discussion on the problems faced by a patient who is having this uh, disorder now to uh, give, give one minute to read this so that's a background so when you are looking at a piece of art you must know a bit about the background why this artist uh, did this right and uh, how he was trying to depict a doctor whom he knew right now in in this uh, strategy called visual thinking strategy what we do is you ask students to look at a picture and if you really want to appreciate a piece of art uh, they say you have to stare at a picture for about 15 to 20 minutes but uh, i will just give you one or two minutes right this is a famous picture students are you looking at this and now you would have come up with some ideas now you should be able to describe you have to do it now but to yourself why am i thinking of such and such an interpretation okay you have got it okay and you've got the reasons but now i will take you to show you other areas of looking at it so one thing is he is looking at the child who is dying or might have died from the way the hands are and something has fallen 
whether it was a crumpled piece of paper from the child, we don't know. But the doctor is looking at the child. And the father is looking at the doctor from behind. He is in the dark. As if to show that the father is not really, even in this whole problem, he is really in the dark. He is not aware of what's happening. The father is behind, anxiously looking at the daughter. Right? And the father is keeping his hand on his wife. That's the mother who is praying and not looking at the child. The mother feels that the child has gone. Okay? You can see the hands. She is praying. And you can realize that it's a very poor household. They don't even have a proper bed for the child. It's chairs they are using. And the sort of utensils they have. And even from the window you can see the, the sort of environment they are in during the industrial revolution. So now when you show all this, you see, is there anyone who got all the points? I also didn't get it on the first round. You know, it took some time. And uh, if, you, if you just Google it, you will get so much of information. And if you ask ChatGPT, she will also give a lot of information. Right? But uh, we know that students use that, but uh, you can still learn in that interaction with the students. So that's in relation to visual. So we talked about literature, then about the visual, and now about performances. Uh, the silent mentor is something we have tried out even in Sabaragam. And that's where we teach students that the cadaver is your silent teacher or a silent mentor. It is not a body to be kicked around, cut up and used to learn. A simple strategy of getting them to write a letter to the donors changes their perception. You just tell them, write a letter thanking the donors of the body. We get them to have religious ceremonies and in some universities they in fact get students to be there when the body is, bodies are donated to the faculty. So it really changes your perception. When we were students, the body was used as uh, just a end, means to an end, just to study. And we used to make jokes about things, we used to cut up pieces and put them into lunch boxes of batchmates and play hell. But that's wrong uh, and that's part of the brutalizing process which happens in faculties. So now that we know it, uh, we have to you know, say that we've done it, very sorry, we have to change things. So activities, uh, some of the universities use activities, very simple activity. They get a wheelchair, get a student to be the carer and another student to sit on the wheelchair, wrap their legs in a false bandage, send them into a mall. And you will realize the different ways people look at you. They stare at the leg, they make comments, they will say, Ane pao, pao. Nothing else. Some will not look at you. 
So you learn the other side. That's the important thing. You learn to feel like the patient, empathy, compassion, and so on. So then there are other methods like theater of the oppressed. I won't go into detail, but that's why you use theater uh, and uh, you get them to play roles and music therapy and dance and so on. So those are all related to performance. So the impact of these, there are few studies which have looked at the impact, attitudinal development and empathy scales. There are some of the scales that I mentioned Jefferson empathy scale which is used and uh, in most studies exposure to the arts formally in the curriculum improves the empathy of students. Even if it doesn't improve the empathy of the students, students enjoy it. In this barren medical faculty curriculum because they are getting a break. And some of them are very talented, very talented to the extent of you will find at least two or three students who are at the level of public performance standard, not amateurs playing music. So you are nurturing and helping them to un be part of this uh, teaching process. And are there theories of learning? Yes. There are theories of learning and one main theory is this transformative learning where you uh, give a certain scenario which, which causes a sort of discomfort to your normal belief system and then you uh, change your attitudes. I won't go into too much detail but these are some of the uh, results of the scoping review. Now, finally, I will quickly deal with the lessons from Colombo. So, Colombo, we started with a curriculum reform and I have, I'm happy that we got some of the products of that curriculum, the new curriculum in, this, in your faculty. And uh, we had the faculty curriculum progressing in 1995 where we brought in ethics, professionalism, communication throughout the five years. And that slowly developed and 2016 we established the Department of Medical Humanities. We had the first international conference on medical humanities in 2018 and now we've changed the behavioral sciences stream to humanities, society and professionalism to reflect this introduction of arts and humanities. At the same time we had a parallel one. I mentioned about the hidden curriculum where we, students were having concerts and uh, musical events and so on outside the curriculum. But what has now happened is we have brought in the arts into the formal curriculum. That's the crucial thing. It's no longer something which happens after 4 p.m. It's something which happens where the timetable says you've got a program. And we started with one lecture in uh, 2012 on the arts and humanities to depict illness and now we've got a much bigger program. In uh, 2021, during the COVID epidemic, uh, we introduced this program called Humanitas, which was an in initiative which looked at uh, certain health related uh, issues like uh, one example was they addressed the, uh, the LGBTQI. So we got people who are openly gay, openly who have shifted their gender from male to female with their consent. They, they were interviewed. And again to show the students that you might have your own beliefs, but society has its own way of doing things. And when you're a professional, the person in front of you is treated as a person, as a human being. You can't say this patient is gay, I am not going to look at this patient, this patient wants to become a female, I am not going to look after that patient, that won't do. Right? So just to open up the discussion with the students. And uh, recently we in fact had 
a program on Ravindranath Tagore and it was accompanied by a four day exhibition, an art exhibition where students also participated. And uh, so it was a wider program which was used to showcase Ravindranath Tagore's music, his art and his philosophy. So this is just to show you the conference we held in 2018. Um, which was a trailblazer because that's the one which made us realize that arts and humanities can be formally introduced to the curriculum. And on your right is a book which we have written. I will hand over a few copies to you all so that you can have a look at those and see if something uh, will be useful. Now, one important way of justifying this all this time I was talking about humanities improving uh, empathy and compassion based on certain studies. But we, uh, we came up with this group of work called the mirror neurons. To put it very simply, uh, humans are humans because you can read the mind of other humans we were probably weaker than the Neanderthal but we beat the Neanderthal because we cooperated. We are here because we cooperate and it's not competition. The economists want to think of, us, think of it as competition. They want us to be consuming and competition. No, we are here because we cooperate. So how did we Cooperate, there's a biological basis, and that's a mirror neurons. That is, when someone does an activity, you also mirror that activity. You can mirror that emotion. So it's the neurophysiological basis for empathy and compassion. There's a neurophysiological basis. Now, we find that uh, that's a very powerful argument with the biomedical community. Resistance to introduce these comes from the biomedical community. And if you show them neurophysiological uh, evidence, they tend to soften. So that's another bit of uh, a few points uh, just to reflect on. So, what are the lessons from Colombo? I described to you the wide experience from the world as well as Southeast Asia. If you really summarize what's the lesson, what are the lessons from Colombo? We have a core group of people who are interested. We introduced it formally into the curriculum. We justified it using the neurophysiological argument. We have a structure by having a department we tapped on local resources, right? people around the arts around us. We engaged with the students so much so that now students are part and parcel of the Humanitas program, for example. They perform, they love to perform uh, in this program. Attendance is mandatory, registers are marked, but there is no formal assessment. So students will come. Those who want to sleep might, may sleep, but we don't want to give a mark. And in, in the 100, you might get 10, 15 who really convert, and that's what we are after. So in conclusion, uh, Dr. Nadraja Sibaraja's leg legacy of compassion and kindness forged during times of armed conflict continues and it continues to resonate within the faculty of medicine university of jaffna as well as the community as we navigate towards a new era of artificial intelligence we are presented with both challenges and opportunities ai will increasingly play a pivotal role in healthcare potentially replacing much of the expertise currently provided by doctors and other health workers. 
However, the importance of humane values and humane skills will only grow. Therefore, humanities will continue to play a vital role in nurturing compassion, empathy and altruism. As stewards of this legacy, the University of Jaffna is presented with a unique opportunity to innovate and pioneer a distinctive program through a dedicated department of humanities that celebrates both Tamil and Hindu culture of the region. Positioned as a beacon to the world, you can redefine healthcare with compassion at its core, perpetuating the light ignited by Dr. Nadraja Sivaraja in our hearts. Now I want you to think that Dr. Sivaraja is in front of you and he is going to summarize what you heard. I'll give you 30 seconds. I hope he would say this. Empathy and compassion are essential for health care professionals and he has shown it to us. Empathy and compassion can be nurtured. I've shown you the evidence of that. There's a role for the arts in promoting empathy and compassion in health care professionals. Let us thank him once again for showing us the way. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your inspiring lectures in Humanities in Medical Education, well explaining the empathy and compassion. And also you have stressed the importance of carrying empathy among the medical students. And very well explained poem regarding the feelings of an ill person and their loved ones. Thank you, sir. And once again, I would like to invite Professor S. Sri Satnaraja, Vice Chancellor, University of Jaffna, to honor our orator, Professor Sarah J. Singh, Emeritus Professor of Medicine, Founder Professor of Medical Humanities, University of Colombo, with a special token of appreciation. Thank you, sir. I would like to call upon Professor R. Surendra Kumaran, Dean, Faculty of Medicine, University of Jaffna, to deliver the vote of thanks. It is my in-depth to thank Orator Emeritus Professor Saro J. Singh, a professor of uh, medicine, uh, Faculty of Medicine, uh, University of Colombo, on the humanities in medical education, current and future, for Dr. Sivaraja Memorial Oration 2024, who was my mentor, teacher, and colleague more than that he is one of the pioneers of the Department of Community Medicine and many other public health programs in Sri Lanka and outside Sri Lanka. And his contribution to the community as uh, uh, correctly that uh, enlightened by our orator here and his contribution for the health system development and also then uh, develop more uh, services a particularly marginalized community and then the most of, more than that and he is a role model for many of the graduates to for the human health so the topic is more suitable for his uh, uh, work and then for this remember his work uh, by all of us and also then uh, i would like to thank uh, Professor Saro J. Singer, so when Professor uh, Kumaran that contacted him initially and then uh, Dr. Kunye was coordinating and uh, he being here in person in Jaffna to deliver oration. Uh, I know so that you are very busy but despite your busy schedule then you are, you are able to make it and all very humble to have you here. Uh, he 
uh, your guidance in many aspects, as well including strengthening our personal professional stream as like a similar to behavioral science stream that started in uh, Faculty of Medicine, University of Columbus, that, uh, as you said, and now you are able to uh, become like a department and we need to also think about that, how we can in-house this uh, stream uh, to be delivered uh, and then incorporated in the uh, normal curriculum. So I have known him and uh, have uh, been working in many aspects. So my first encounter was in 2004 with, uh, uh, actually this was not related to the medicine. This was related to the poverty and uh, uh, health. It was a workshop, uh, uh, this, is, this is a short course by the, uh, Professor Saroj Singh and Dr. Samath uh, Samaraki uh, that was supported by the World Bank. Then I was the junior lecturer. I used to go in the Friday and Saturday, this course was in uh, learning a lot of things uh, he was <coughs> that course was made and then uh, the many forums and things and we all worked and he's a very uh, generous and humble man then to learn a lot of things from him I also want to thank uh, Vice Chancellor Professor Sri Sakunaja for his support and guidance to organize this oration uh, his commitment to support the oration is remarkable Many activities are happening at the university, so I know that uh, sir, you are very busy, but we, uh, within that, that you are able to make it here. Thank you so much. I also would like to thank uh, Dr. Sivaraja family for facilitating the oration and also attending the event. I thank the uh, distinguished guests uh, from various departments, organizations, for physically and uh, remotely participating in oration. My thanks go to uh, council members, uh, former uh, academics and current academics, uh, and the deans of the faculties, and our supportive uh, and administrative and non-supportive, uh, non-academic supportive staff for contribution to organize this event. Uh, the event, event is not possible without the support of uh, as an officer of uh, academics uh, and uh, staff, the head uh, Dr. P. D. Kunji and the uh, team <coughs> from Department of Community and Family Medicine and Office of the Dean, uh, Faculty of Medicine. I thank all the participants for gracing the occasion physically and online. Finally, I would like to thank all the people who contributed to success of the event. Thank you so much.